Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast a podcast brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Welcome to the final half hour of our two-part series with serial startup entrepreneur, Paolo Lencioni. In part one, Paolo talked to us about his first startup with his wife, Anne, and walked us through the challenges and lessons that they've learned along the way. Then we drilled further into their journey of starting other businesses, building them up and eventually selling them. Today in part two, we drill deeper into more practical tips for entrepreneurs who are thinking of starting a business and for business owners who are in that growth phase and may be gearing up for a sale into the future. So don't go anywhere and we'll get started. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to The Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area. And hear the industry's best recount their real-life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Are there any elements that you have learned along the way from your own experiences of building these two businesses in the past and selling them and, you know, building your current businesses that, you know, you've come to over this time and that you're then able to pass on to your clients to help them with their business? Yeah, definitely. So the number one lesson comes back to like when I fitted out and did all the tiling and plumbing and stuff. <laughs> in the first thing. Like, don't do that stuff. You're better off in most cases doing what you do well. So like now currently I work as a, you know, as an accounting business advisor. Admittedly, what I earn per hour is much better than what I earned as a vet. So it's much easier to make that decision now is that if I have something to be done, any, anything like be it um, plumbing or be it fixing a car or being out, I mean, I don't wash my own car. I don't clean my own house. I don't cook my own meals. I don't, um, you know, f- clean my own swimming pool or anything like that. I'd rather spend that, that time in the office doing what I do and then um, delegate absolutely everything else out to other people who can do it for me. So it, uh, it increases my ability to, to, to do what I do and keep my focus. So for me, everything I can give out like that, I give out now. Um, we actually deal with a lot of business owners that want to hang on to stuff, like classically the bookkeeping. So for me, I'm an accountant. Uh, we don't do the bookkeeping for our own business. We have our bookkeepers do it for us because from that perspective, you know, you don't want to be doing that kind of stuff when what you really should be doing is more important strategic planning, staff engagement things. So, um, so that kind of stuff is, is, is probably the most important lesson. And why, why do you think people hold on to, you know, let, let's take bookkeeping as an example. Why, why are they holding on to, why are these veterinary practices holding on to the bookkeeping when clearly that's not their, uh, you know, the, their expertise? I think it's a prioritization thing and control issue. So people feel that um, if they're doing that kind of stuff, they're more in control of their business. Yeah. The reality is you're probably better off doing something else for your business than that. There's other better ways of keeping control of your business. So from our perspective, like staff engagement is the number one. How are you engaging your team? Are you running appraisals? Are you doing all those other important things that drive your your, your team? Um, and people, I think, confuse management with, uh, well, they confuse management and administration. Administration isn't something you should be doing. Management is something you should be doing. And uh, for me, bookkeeping is administration. It's a data entry person who sits there in front of a computer uh, doing data entry, not the kind of person who goes out, uh, drives sales in the business, motivates their team and leads their team. Two completely different people. They like you, you very often, very rare that you get someone who's good at data entry that's very good at the other stuff. So people confuse that. They say, oh, I'm doing management and I roster off a day a week to do management. Oh, what are you doing in that management? Oh, I'm doing the bookkeeping. Oh, well, that's not management. That's the <laughs> <laughs> so, and I guess, you know, implicit in what you're saying is that the requirement for business owners to to have an understanding of what they can do that creates value in their business yeah, exactly. and an understanding of what else they're doing in their business that can be delegated. So, so this is the point, right? Get rid of that other stuff that you can delegate. Yeah. 
for sure. So delegate the other, all that stuff and do the high, high, high level stuff. So that like for me in this business, like I'm still very, very engaged in like sales is one of the, my primary functions here. Um, I'm not a salesperson. I don't like doing sales, but I certainly am very effective at it. And I definitely don't do any administrative work as a result of that. So if I have a choice, I will say, okay, well, I'll do sales role. Um, even though I'd like to bury myself in my office for some quiet time in front of a computer, <laughs> uh, I have to be customer facing and do that sort of stuff. And look, I, I think you're clearly very focused as well. I mean, it sounds like you're very busy, but you're busy. You've been really strategic about the things that you're busy on, you, you know. Uh, and I guess when you talk about all of these, uh, this education you're going through, you were clearly setting, you, you know, you've set yourself up as a differentiator. You know, it sounds like there's a lot of strategy to it. There is a lot of strategy to it. I guess, again, this is where I'm re- really lucky with my wife, Anne, because she's more like the sensible one. I have a lot of ideas. I'm very, very, like, like my brain doesn't stop ticking, but a lot of them are not good ideas. So um, <laughs> I have someone to say, that's a dumb idea, that's a dumb idea, that's a dumb idea. And then one out of every 10, 10 she says, that's probably a good idea. Uh... So it's always good. I guess the other thing of advice is like, I'm lucky in that I haven't had to do this on my own. Yeah. So if you have to have that support of someone close, that um, you can bounce ideas off um, is very important, I think, yeah. to anyone who's doing this kind of stuff. I think a lot of us entrepreneurs need an and, don't we, to... Uh... <laughs> yeah, but it can come in the form of a, of a business advisor, for example, you know, someone you can pick up and say, hey, what do you think of this idea? It can come in, it can come in the form of a friend uh, who's very good at business. It can come in different shapes and forms. For me, it's lucky you are. I mean, it's in the form of Anne. And Anne will probably say the same thing of me, like that we can bounce ideas off each other. Uh, we have a different approach to things um, in many ways, but we can at least tell each other when it's a dumb idea or a good one. <laughs> so I guess number two here in your uh, tips, uh, you know, make sure make sure you have an Anne in the business. Someone to bounce your ideas off. I think, I think that's support. I think a lot of entrepreneurs find themselves on their own. And I think that, it, I mean, it can be in, in the form of an entrepreneur support group. You know, you get these entre- uh, entrepreneurs groups where people, they can they get together once a week and they can sound ideas off each other and make friends and then, you know, support each other. Um, and I think that's that's very, very, I have a friend who works in the software industry. In fact, he's my partner in the software business. And he also has another software business on the side and he bounces his ideas off me. He uses me for that. So I think it's important to have someone there that, that you can bounce ideas off because thinking you sometimes don't have the clarity to step back as when you're in the business yourself, just step back and say, hey, like maybe I should look at this from a distance and see where this is going to get me long term. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And sometimes I think it's in that communication piece as well, uh, you know, in in talking out your ideas sometimes but also to someone else, it really helps to um, form in your mind, you know, what those ideas are as well. So I, I completely agree with that. And then, you, you know, I, I guess um, are there any other elements that you feel you've learned along the way that are really pivotal to um, success? Success in a business? Um, knowing when to take on professional advice. Yeah. Well, we'd agree with that one, wouldn't we? <laughs> um, we see a lot of mistakes being made when that doesn't happen, both in our business and from our own experiences in the past where we haven't. So from that perspective, you know, like if you do have a high value uh, thing going on, be it a valuation or sale of a business or sell part of a business or a joint venture, get the right legal advice, get the right accounting advice, make sure you structure it properly. You know, people feel like, oh, I feel stupid that I don't know about this and I feel embarrassed to approach an advisor, get over that. Like there's no, no, like if you've got where you've got with your own businesses and built your own business and you're getting to the point of selling them, you know, you're definitely not going to be looked upon as a stupid person. Or if any advisor looks at you on you as a, as a silly person, go find another one because that, you know, you, you don't, you're not expected to know that stuff. But like we don't even expect to know like where it comes and the international tax issues and stuff that were created by our previous uh, say, oh, we didn't even know that stuff because we don't deal with it. So just get someone to do that stuff. So, and and it's interesting that you say that. Uh, do you believe that um, business owners sometimes have a fear that they'll be seen as silly if they don't know um, how to deal with with some of these areas that they've never dealt with before? Isn't isn't that fascinating? I, I probably. That might be a re- revelation to a lot of people listening here, I think. That's what um, well, the feedback we get from our veterinary customers is they feel comfortable speaking to us because we were veterinarians and um, they don't feel stupid asking us questions. 
So like if they have to ask a question, like how many business owners actually do understand a balance sheet? They don't, but most of them won't admit it. The point of that is you actually don't have to fully understand it to operate your business properly. The information that comes out of it can be aggregated by your accountant like quarterly or a monthly basis. So you, you don't have to be expected to know that stuff. You can't know everything. You know, run your business, be a veterinarian, be a doctor, be a dentist, do all that stuff, deal with your customers, do the sales, and then understand all the fundamental principles of accounting and law and all that stuff. You can't. So you just the stuff you don't know, you get you you just pay for someone to do it. Which is point number three. Point number three is going to be just pay for it, like pay for it. So um, this is the other issue we see is business owners penny pinching saying, oh, look, there's this little bit of software and it's costing. The example I had the other day, we're interviewing a bookkeeper and the current um, uh, boss she's working for uh, makes her delete everything in the accounting file and put another company in so that she, so that they don't have to pay for two zero licenses. Oh my goodness, you're kidding. <laughs> That's like 40, 40 bucks a month. Like we see this stuff all the time. So that's like 40 bucks a month. What's that costing you in staff time, right? So um, I actually assess everything, not in terms of dollar value, but in terms of time. So for example, we have we something like 8 to 10% of our revenue goes towards software licenses. But we can run our team probably about 30 to 40% leaner in this business because of the automations and efficiencies. So everything I look at is it might cost $10,000 a month. I don't care. Does that save me $10,000 a month in time or more? That's the way I look at everything. Everything I score now is not in by dollar, it's by minute. So if that's going to save, cost me $10, but it's going to save me an hour a week, it's going to cost me $10 a month. That's a no brainer. So, um, so that sort of stuff is, is like spent for whatever it does to automate your team, make your team's life easy, um, automate the processes in your business. Just throw your money at that because that's where most businesses fall over. Their wages get too high because their team is just struggling through old stuff. Mm, that's a really good point. I love it. I love it. Okay, good. So we've got some three top tips here. And now I want to maybe understand a little bit more about how your previous experiences now also have driven your feelings about what you're doing with your current business. Is this a business you're building to sell? Do you have now a, a clear strategy or um, is it just building it and one day you, you, know, you, you feel you might get approached again? Look, from this perspective, this current business we've got now is we're very comfortable in it, I must admit. Um, so I'm certainly never got to the point of where I'm saying I'm bored, um, I'm not enthused. Because as soon as I, if I were to start feeling unenthusiastic about it, it's probably also a good time to look at, you know, checking out. For me, it's definitely this, this particular thing we're doing now is something I'm, I'm intent to stick with now for easily the next 10 to 15 years. I think I'd be stupid not to think about an exit strategy, though. So um, we do have plans in place for an exit strategy in terms of um, my ideal exit strategy would be to introduce other partners into the business and then a great, younger ones, obviously younger than me, hopefully, um, <laughs> so that, so that, um, so that um, you know, eventually you have to always have that at the back of the mind. What happens if I check out and what happens if um, I get sick? So, and from us, um, our business, in my view, our current business is high, at high risk for that because the two key individuals, myself and my wife, and in that scenario now, um, if either of us gets sick, it's high risk because the other one might not be able to work. So, from a risk management perspective, I've got to start thinking about bringing more um, advisory brains into the business where the business can run itself more freely of myself and Anne. So, that's going to would be one of my focuses now, and that will eventually lead to a succession strategy. So. Yeah, so so that now that is probably one of our top priorities at this point in time because we're acutely aware of this. Uh, it's risk management for us also. As I say, we have no sentimentality about, oh, this was my business, it's my baby. Um, we have an obligation to keep our current team employed if something helps, uh, goes wrong with us um, and the business can sustain itself if something help, um, goes wrong with either of us. So from that perspective, a success, every business owner has to think of a succession plan. You can't not be thinking about that and assume that you're going to be happy and healthy for the next 15 years. Mm, that I think that is such, I, I mean, that's such a good point. And it's something that we talk about quite a bit on this podcast, but I just think, you know, having someone who's building their own business and living this in their own business is such a, um, you know, is such a brilliant example of why, why this is so important. And I, I mean, just to interject, I mean, I have this like deep thing that I want to cling on to my asset. I, I always, I often feel like that, like it's mine and I want to keep it. But I've got to put that feeling aside because I know that like I've got to think of the 15-year game plan here and where I'm going to be in 15 years or might be in 15 years in terms of health. So these things always like you have to, a lot of business owners will cling to their asset. 
and say, oh, it's mine and I'll hang on to it right up until the last minute and give it. It doesn't work out like that. You know, you're not going to get sick and find a perfect buyer in the same month. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you'll get sick and then you'll linger and struggle along to find a perfect buyer and all that time your business will degrade and then your staff will be, lose their job security. So um, the bigger a business gets, the more obligations you've got, the more people depend on you. So from that perspective, you've got to think of succession. Mm. And here you're you're talking about bringing other people into the ownership or the equity of the business, which sounds like it's not something that you've done before. I think for many business owners, that is a um, it's a really challenging concept. And number one, as you say, well, it's my baby, it's my asset. I don't want to let go of it, and I don't necessarily know that I'll agree with all of the um, points of view. That that someone else coming on board might have. And so where are you at in that process? And, and do you have any recommendations for business owners? And obviously you've talked about, okay, well, it's important to think about what could happen and the importance of getting yourself lined up for that event. But are there any other tips that you think that, you know, maybe that have related to the own processes that you've been thinking through in, in relation to this? So without saying anything, I shouldn't really say online in terms of confidentiality and things. Um, so in terms of succession, we have isolated individuals who we would introduce into the business already. Um, so I can think of three people already that we're targeting and we're waiting for their current um, scenario to change or, or be favorable so that they can move in and start working here. So just like when we sold the first software business, you have to start looking um, if you're not looking, you're not going to find it. It's not going to just fall in your lap. So there's three individuals we've already, we, we can already uh, target for that particular purpose. And then we have a, another option where we could potentially look at merging or doing a joint venture or um, yeah, basically a merger with another bigger advisory firm so that we could bring all their advisors and their board in with us so that we'd run as one and so there's more people there. So there's, there's those options we've got. And um, and we keep on looking and seeing which one materializes first, and if it's viable at that time. Uh, but we're looking now for what we for what we know we need in, in in ten to fifteen years time. So um, and again, if someone came out of the blue and made an offer, and I thought they were the right person, if they did that tomorrow, so say when's the right time to check out of the business? When the offer's right and the person who approaches me is right, could be tomorrow, it could be. But if that happened in the interim, I would also be very open to that. Um, I'm not. The kind of person who's going to say, no, I'm not ready to sell just yet. I'll, uh, you know, I'll, um, I'll wait another 10 years. Um, if I'm not ready to quit working, which I'm not, and I want to do this for another 15 years, I'll do it with someone else here and I'll carry on working here. Um, so I don't have to buy it outright, but, you know, that I'm looking at all the time, actively looking all the time. I love it. I love it. Uh, look, thank you so much for your time today. Look, this has been such an interesting journey through, um, I guess, hearing your progression through each of these businesses. And it's really clear in talking how each of your experiences have really sort of molded and shaped you for each of the next experiences that you've gone on to. It's a fascinating story and I think a lot in there for us as advisors as well. You know, certainly the point that you make about perhaps some of our clients, you know, the business owners not wanting to ask questions that they think is silly. And I'm just thinking of myself, actually, you know, we have a number of transactions at the moment where some responses from different parties has been a little bit gruff and a little bit hard to understand it. I'm now looking at it through a new light based on what you've just said. I think maybe we're dealing with people who perhaps don't quite understand the area fully and, and don't want to say it. So that's important for us as biz, business advisors, I think, to keep really key in our minds. Well, look, thank you so much for your time. Is there anything that you want to promote on our podcast? I guess, should any of our clients have, or any of our listeners have vets, you know, maybe maybe they might want to um, chat to you about your software and, you, you know, your veterinary accounting perspectives. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I mean, me now, software is at the, I'll tell you, I'll do the website. I'll say profitdiagnostics.com. That's a website. That's as much as I'll say. That's a promotion. Um, I'll say, I'm, I'm, I'm just, it's just fun doing this. So. <laughs> well, it's so fun having you. <laughs> so, thank so thanks so much for, uh, for having me. It's been fun. Thank you for coming on to our show. We'll put a link through to you in um, our show notes and your uh, your website there just in case anyone wants to chat about that fabulous software and your services that you're talking about. I, um, I really appreciate your time. It's been great talking. Thanks, Jana. Well, that ends our two-part series with serial startup entrepreneur Paolo Lencioni. 
As a quick recap, the four important lessons that Paolo talked about were, number one, have an understanding of what you can do as a business owner that creates value in your business and then delegate everything else. Number two, have someone to bounce ideas off. Now, sometimes this can come in the form of a mentor, a business advisor, or a friend, or even in Paolo's case, a, uh, a, a business partner or even your spouse. Number three, know when to take on professional expert advice. Don't be afraid or embarrassed to admit what you don't know and don't understand and go and find someone who is an expert in this area to help you with it. And number four, finally, but not least, automate what you can or pay someone else to do the things that you don't know because that can save you precious time, which can reap value for your business. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this discussion just as much as I did. I really do love talking about real stories from business owners who have been out there building and selling businesses. And in fact, I guess as you're listening to this podcast, you're probably interested in that as well. So look, I'm always on the lookout for these sorts of stories. So if you happen to know anyone with a really good story, if you have one yourself, about a really interesting experience in the area of business mergers and acquisitions, or a really interesting experience of someone who has built a business over time and then gotten to the point of selling it. I would love to speak to you or them. So just get in contact with me, head over to our show notes and you'll find a link there to our website at www.aspectlegal.com.au or at www.thedealroompodcast.com. And there you can find links through to our website where we have a contact page. You can contact us there and we can then line up a time to chat about your story. Well, look, once again, I hope you enjoyed what you heard today. If you did, then you can subscribe to The Deal Room Podcast on iTunes or your favourite podcast player, which gets you the benefit of getting notifications straight to your phones whenever a new episode is out. And look, we'd love to hear your feedback as well. So if you've enjoyed this today, then we implore you to please leave us a review and rating because that really helps us to reach more people. Well, thanks again for listening in. This has been Joanna Oki and The Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition. So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen. that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. 